This is your news tonight. The headlines. A show of solidarity. The leaders of France, Germany, Italy and Romania announced that they support Ukraine getting EU candidate status, saying the country belongs in the European family. NATO allies agreed to strengthen the presence of combat troops in the eastern parts of the alliance as a further deterrence against Russian aggression. Getting ready for a bumpy ride, the U.S. Federal Reserve and the Bank of England both raise interest rates to counter high inflation numbers. Here in the Cube, we'll take a closer look at a top-secret document allegedly signed by the Azov Battalion. Good evening, welcome to the program. I'm Per Bergforce Nyberg. Top EU leaders traveled to Kiev today in a show of Western support for Ukraine in its fight against Russian aggression. German Chancellor Scholz, Italian Prime Minister Draghi, French President Macron and Romanian President Johannes met with President Zelensky for the first time since the war began. The heads of states discussed Ukraine's accession to the European Union as well as plans to rebuild the country. Speaking in a joint press conference, Zelensky underscored the importance of unity and said Ukraine is one step further towards EU membership. Emmanuel Macron and Olaf Scholz insisted that Europe was behind them. By the unprecedented sanctions that we have adopted, by the huge economic, humanitarian and military support that each of our countries and the whole EU has given to Ukraine, and that we will again intensify. We are, and we always will be, at your side to defend your sovereignty. Mr. President, dear colleagues, I'm in Kyiv to bring you one very clear message. Ukraine belongs to the European family. Now let's bring in our international correspondent Annelise Borges who joins us live from Paris. Good evening Annelise. So what was the main outcome of today's meeting? Hi there Pero. I guess the most significant outcome of the visit really was that unanimous message of support for Ukraine's EU membership. Uh, all leaders, including, of course, Mario Draghi, Olaf Scholz and Emmanuel Macron, spoke about the importance of Ukraine deciding its own future and the fact that the country definitely had a place in Europe. They were all effectively welcoming Volodymyr Zelensky into the bloc. And this is significant because these uh, three leaders in particular took quite some time to travel to the Ukrainian capital. It took them more than three months and they were preceded by several other Eastern European leaders, but also EU representatives who travel there to show their support uh, towards Ukraine. Many Ukrainian authorities uh, perceived this as a divide between Eastern European leaders who really meant what they said in terms of support financial but also military support and others more uh, perhaps more distant uh, leaders those in the west of europe who still had business to attend to for example of course emmanuel macron had an election here to win uh, there were uh, there was a perception that these leaders had other priorities and today they were all trying to dissipate that image trying to show that they really mean business and they were not only there to talk about politics and to talk about this session but they were also talking about uh, financial commitments they were talking about military uh, commitments france promising another uh, lot of Caesar, long, uh, long distance artillery to, to Ukraine, uh, and of course, talking about how they are going to try and push Russia to accept a UN brokered deal that would see Ukrainian exports of grains resume once again. Annelise, you just got back from a trip to Ukraine where you reported extensively from that country. We know that Zelensky has repeatedly been asking for more weapons. Many have said that the West just isn't doing enough. How are these European leaders viewed there in Ukraine? Well, um, many uh, of those that I met, those uh, people that I met on the ground in Ukraine, um, have a perception that indeed the help isn't coming fast enough. I mean, 
uh, obviously, this is a very particular point of view. These are people who are fighting on the ground, who are faced with the Russian threat, the threat of the Russian army, a very powerful army, on a daily basis. They said today that those air raid sirens that were uh, sounding across the Ukrainian capital uh, were a reminder to those leaders that the war is very much a reality for them, that that is their daily uh, realities. Uh, many of the people I met uh, across uh, Ukraine during the last few months that I've been going back and forth uh, do say that the times are pressing, that this is an urgent matter. It is a matter of life and death and that uh, the war in the east of the country is a very particular one, is one that's been going on for eight years now. Many casualties had already been registered before the start of Russia's invasion on February the 24th, and they said that they want to prevent the loss of even more Ukrainian lives. Uh, it's very interesting because many have a picture of particularly Germany and France being uh, very uh, strong when it comes to diplom diplomacy, but not very strong when it comes to uh, a concrete response. Many of the soldiers I met, for example, all remember uh, the time when all Germany was ready to send were those 5,000 helmets, uh, while Eastern European countries were already committing to lethal weapons towards Ukraine. And of course, uh, there's still quite a lot of resentment towards Emmanuel Macron, who recently said that Russia should not be quote unquote humiliated. It's very interesting because there's also um, a new term that uh, circulates among Ukrainian troops, in particular in the east of the country. Uh, the term is uh, Macroné, uh, which uh, roughly translates as uh, talking a lot uh, and not saying uh, much or not meaning uh, much. Many of the soldiers told me that they started using that term when they saw pictures of Emmanuel Macron portraitedly uh, showing him uh, speaking on the phone, looking very serious, looking very worried about the situation in Ukraine, but never even showing up uh, in the country to show his support. Uh, so uh, he speaks volumes about what is expected of European leaders at this stage. Many of the people I've been meeting in Ukraine over the last uh, three months tell me the same thing. They're fighting not only for their future, but for the future of the whole of Europe. And today, these uh, three leaders, alongside the Romanian president, were there to show that they understand that message. Uh, Emmanuel Macron actually said that the future of security across Europe is being fought for in Ukraine right now. Thank you, Annelies Borges, live from Paris. And now I want to turn to Brussels, where we have our correspondent, Maeve McMahon, joining us live. Maeve, uh, good evening to you. Today we heard from these four European leaders in Kiev that they support Ukraine's efforts to become a candidate to join the EU. At the same time, Portugal's prime minister told the FT this week that a candidate status would, be, would, would risk giving false expectations. So where does the EU stand on this? And I mean, is, is it possible to bring Ukraine into the bloc right now? Two very good questions. Well, that announcement is coming today from Kyiv uh, on the day of that visit of those four leaders is huge news for Ukraine. Of course, it doesn't reflect the opinion of all EU heads of state. We will hear hesitance next week in that EU summit from countries like Portugal, as you mentioned, also Denmark and also Hungary, with the Hungarian prime minister known for his close ties to Viktor Orban. That said, the European Commission tomorrow will come out with its opinion on that candidacy, potential candidacy for Ukraine. And it's likely to encourage EU heads of state and government to welcome this status. And not just for Ukraine, but also for Moldova, but not for Georgia. That also applied back in March. But in the meantime, if they do receive that candidacy at that summit, it won't mean that Ukraine will enter the bloc overnight. It will come with strings attached. And also what happens when a country becomes a candidate, it then enters into negotiations. It needs to start reforming and open up 35 various different chapters that cover all areas of EU policy. Once those chapters are completed, then a session treaty can be penned. That treaty pair needs to be ratified by all EU member states and as well the country itself. As you can imagine, this process takes time. Or some are anticipating that if Ukraine does ever become an EU member state, it could take at least a decade. You can take a listen now to Michael Emerson, an expert on all things EU enlargement from SEPS, a think tank here in Brussels. Adopt as a marker 
that Croatia took from the Commission's opinion to actual accession took 10 years, a decade. And so I would say for Ukraine, a decade also. I would not say, like President Macron, decades in the plural. I say this partly because Ukraine has, since 2014, been implementing a very ambitious association and free trade agreement with the EU. And um, this means that if you look at it uh, as an accession uh, candidate, they're almost halfway there. I mean, they've been doing it in parallel without being an acknowledged uh, candidate. And the same is true uh, of Moldova and Georgia. So all eyes on that EU summit next week to see what the final overall EU decision is. But many experts worrying that Ukraine, like many countries in the Western Balkans, even that our candidates could be left dangling for years and years and years. And Maeve, uh, NATO alliance members have also been meeting there in Brussels today to discuss the situation in Ukraine. What was the key outcome of that meeting? Well, Per, there was no real concrete outcome. Today's meeting was really just preparing for the big NATO summit taking place in a couple of weeks over in Madrid. So we heard today from the NATO Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, just reiterating his support for Ukraine and expressing how Russia was responsible for all the suffering and saying that Russians' aggression was a game-changer for NATO and a game-changer for the world. Now, what everyone's wondering is whether or not NATO will supply more weapons to the Ukrainians, something that President Zelensky has been begging for at various NATO summits that we've been covering for the last couple of months here in Brussels. Let's take a listen now to what the Secretary-General today had to say. We are putting together a NATO comprehensive assistance package for Ukraine helping Ukraine improve interoperability with NATO, transition from Soviet era uh, to modern NATO equipment, and further strengthening security institutions. So quite a vague announcement there from the NATO Secretary General. We will, we're hearing, have more concrete details after Madrid. But some sources are telling us in the background of those meetings that they're afraid with some weapons. They're afraid that Ukrainians might not be able to use them. But what we will hear in Madrid at that NATO summit is lots of solidarity and support directed in, uh, towards Ukraine and Ukrainians. And of course, we expect also President Zelensky to appear or at least speak during that uh, Madrid summit of NATO. Thank you so much. Maeve McMahon live from Brussels. The Bank of England has raised its base interest rate to 1.25%, the highest level in 13 years to try and stem strong inflation. It's the fifth consecutive increase since December, with the bank now forecasting that inflation would reach 11% in October. On Wednesday, the U.S. Federal Reserve also increased its key interest rate by three-quarters of a percent, the highest increase since 1994. Fed Chief Jerome Powell warned to expect a similar rise at the central bank's next meeting in July. And for more on this, let's head over to London and speak to James Smith, a developed markets economist at ING Bank. Good evening to you. So three of the members of the Monetary Policy Committee voted for an even larger increase. Do you think that the Bank of England has gone far enough or can we expect more to come? Well, listen, there was a lot of pressure on the Bank of England today because we had the Federal Reserve with their very large historic rate hike yesterday, 75 basis points. You know, and there's been a bit of pressure on the pound as well. We've seen the pound uh, slip against the dollar over the last week or so, or actually uh, gradually over this quarter as well. And that means that just adds to these inflationary pressures in the UK. So there was a lot of pressure on the bank, but in the end, they stuck to their guns. They, they did another 25 basis point rate hike. I think they're work, walking a very narrow path. Yes, inflation is very high, but at the same time, you know, that's a big squeeze on consumers. And we've had a bit of government support to help consumers, but it's still a big squeeze. So we're walking a very fine line between high growth and lower infl uh, high inflation sorry, and lower growth. So I think that's why the bank's proceeding for now a little bit more cautiously than perhaps some had expected today. And how do you think that these interest rate hikes will affect the economy and people's own private wallets? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean... If you look at, uh, at mortgages, for example, in the UK, uh, over the last few years, there's been a lot, much more of a trend towards fixing 
mortgage rates. So actually on the consumer side, it takes a bit of time for those higher interest rates to feed through. I think the more noticeable impact in the shorter term is actually on the business side, because that's where interest rates, um, you know, they don't tend to be as fixed. Uh, in, uh, businesses are on, on variable rates. So it adds to this kind of margin pressure we're seeing uh, for companies, obviously, from higher costs. If consumer demand slowing a bit as well, that sort of reduces their ability to, to pass on costs. So that's how mechanically, I, I think in the shorter term, these higher interest rates are going to weigh on the economy. And James, how worried are you about the global economy entering sort of a downward spiral now with high inflation, low growth and world events that keep on hammering on the economy? Yeah, it's a very difficult backdrop. I think for the second half of the year, it's going to really depend on whether energy prices take another leg higher. Gas prices have increased quite a bit this week on concerns about gas flowing from Russia, but also uh, there's been some issues at a liquefied natural gas terminal in, in the US as well. If we do see a big leg higher, that's going to have a lot of pressure on, on companies, particularly energy intensive manufacturing and industry. Also consumers, of course, through the higher cost of sort of heating their houses and, and so on. So that's my concern right now. I think for the time being, you know, we seem to be steering away from at least a severe sort of downturn right now. One of the good things, at least for now in the US, the UK and Europe, is the jobs market is very strong. And as long as people are keeping their jobs, that means, you know, that sort of limits the downside to consumer activity. So let's see, there's a lot of uncertainty, but it's going to depend a lot on those energy prices. One thing to keep an eye on, James Smith from ING Bank, thank you so much for your time. Now, the eastern Ukrainian port city of Mariupol was captured by Russian forces in May after a month's long siege. Now, a classified document, supposedly written by the Azov Battalion, is claiming that the majority of the population is on Moscow's side. Sofia in the Cube has been investigating. Yes, Per, this classified document allegedly signed by the Azov Battalion was first published on the Telegram channel of RIA Novosti, which is a Russian state media. In it, it says that over 70% of Mariupol's population is loyal to the Kremlin. Just a reminder of what the Azov Battalion is. It's a volunteer ultra-nationalistic militia formed in 2014 to fight against the pro-Russian forces in the Donbass. And during the siege of the city, which you can see was very heavily bombarded this spring, Azov fighters retreated to a steel plant, which remained one of the last contested territories until the city fell to Russia in May. But going back to these claims, Ria says that these documents were found in Mariupol. However, the file never mentions the city, and it especially never mentions the fact that it is the city's population that is loyal to Moscow. However, the file does mention a few Ukrainian villages about 40 to 50 kilometers away, including the village called Oktober. However, the names that are used are the old Russian names which were changed back in 2014 when a lot of Ukrainian cities um, scrapped their former Soviet names. So it's a little strange that the Azov Battalion writing in Ukrainian would refer to these cities in their uh, former Russian names today. Another discrepancy that we found is that the file does not contain a clear date and is not addressed to anyone. In addition, the letter also mentions a fifth and sixth wave of conscription of soldiers. However, in this Ukrainian website, it said that as of April 2022, the country was only seeing its second wave of military mobilization. And after speaking to numerous Ukrainian journalists here at Euronews, all of them confirmed that this document was poorly written, riddled with grammatical mistakes and with strange Russian phrasing. One telling example of this is right here at the top of the document, it says the word sekretna, which is a common word used in Russian, but it is very rarely used in Ukrainian in this sort of context. So per, although we don't know the exact origin of this document, all of these inconsistencies really cast doubts on its authenticity. Thank you there, Sophia, in the cube. American actor Kevin Spacey has been granted unconditional bail from a London court on four charges of sexually assaulting three men. Spacey is also facing a fifth charge of engaging in penetrative sexual activity without consent. The 62-year-old was not asked to enter a plea for the alleged offences, but his lawyer said that he strenuously denies any and all criminality in this case. The alleged incidents took place between 2005 and 2013 in the UK. 
McDonald's will pay 1.25 billion euros to the French state to avoid going to court over tax fraud charges. The fast food giant had been accused of reporting artificially low profits between 2009 and 2020 in an effort to reduce its tax bill. The settlement, which was approved by a Paris court, is the second largest tax settlement in French history after aircraft manufacturer Airbus paid out 2.1 billion euro in 2020. It's gone nearly six decades without being properly cleaned up. Now authorities in Budapest are ramping up efforts to protect the vital stream from pollution. Ben Turner reports. From antique candle holders to old sweaters, workers have pulled five cubic meters of waste from one of Hungary's most important waterways. The Silas stream near Budapest is 25 kilometers long and has suffered serious pollution that threatens wildlife and vegetation. Cleaners have scanned 1.2 kilometers of the murky water, which has revealed a number of strange objects floating on the riverbed. We found a lot of clothes, bras, but there were also tires. Once we even found an antique candle holder. But the most surprising thing was when we pulled out a pair of dentures from the river. After 60 years without dredging, city authorities are hoping to steer the river back to nature. But there are concerns that behaviour among locals also needs to change. You can pull out some astonishing things from this stream. The town plans to clean the water every two months. But this could be useless if they don't change the attitude of locals who may fill up the water with garbage again. Also, other waterways in Hungary are in serious danger. Earlier this year, a river in eastern Slovakia turned orange after being polluted with water from a disused mine. The chemicals killed fish and wildlife over a 15-kilometer stretch before the waterway reached Hungary, according to Greenpeace. Work began in May this year to stop the pollution, which could be carcinogenic, and barriers have been installed to prevent people accessing the river. Ben Turner, Euronews. And thank you for watching Euronews Tonight.